Good. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us online and in the room for this fabulous talk for with Ed Warren, soon to be hosted by Rosie Haig. A few announcements before we start, please. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session. Don't forget, you can Industry Week uh, tag this using the tag IW22. And there is a photo competition running all week. So if you want to take photographs of anybody on stage or even screenshots if you're at home, if you've got something cool, you can send them in and there's a potential for winning a £50 voucher from Amazon. So you can spend it on there. Don't forget, there's lots coming up for the rest of the week. It's still only Thursday. You've got two more days of Industry Week. You can book on to future talks using the iw.confetti.ac.uk URL, and there's lots going on there, and you just need to have the Zoom app installed so that you can join all the online talks. Finally, uh, if you're a current final year student or undergrad course with uh, Worth Confetti, it's worth noting the NTU employability team are offering extra careers coaching appointments next week and into the weeks <coughs> after. So if you are looking for any additional coaching in terms of employability, looking for where you're going to go this summer or when you graduate, please log on and have a look at the employability team and book some additional sessions there. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rosie Haig, who will be interviewing Ed Warren as part of this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> How's it Hi, going? Rosie. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you on the screen. So, everybody in the room and online, um, we have the pleasure today of being joined by Ed, who is an award winning lighting designer in the industry with years of experience working with multiple artists. So, most prominently, at Mumford and Sons, Idols, uh, Metronomy, Fortet, and there's a big Fortet fan in the audience right now, actually. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have some questions. Um, yes, yeah, so what an honour. And just we're going to go through some um, of Ed's history of his experience in the industry. Hopefully, it'll inspire you to uh, see what you could do with your career. Um, so, Ed, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to, nice to not see you. <laughs> There's smiles and waves from the audience, and I'm sure online as well. <laughs> um, so, Ed, I thought we'd start right at the beginning and just um, ask how you how you made your way in the industry. What was your first spark into lighting? Uh, it was it was I was working in a record shop. I just finished university, got a degree in journalism. Uh, I didn't want to be a journalist, so I was working in a record shop, and I made friends with some people who are in a band, and they got a record deal. And after a while, they just asked me to come on tour with them and sell their T-shirts for them. Uh, it was a band called The Delays um, from Southampton. And after a while, I got, you know, I, I realised I didn't want to do merch all my life. No offence to merch people, but I wanted to do something a bit more. And one day we were in the back of the van driving to their hometown gig in Southampton and the band were talking amongst themselves. And they, were, they, they said, oh, yeah, such and such is going to do our lights tonight. And I just thought, hold on a sec, why don't, why don't you let me have a go? Because I've watched your show for the last six months and I know exactly what, what happens and I'd like to give it a try. So they fired Mikey on the spot. Sorry, Mike, uh, if you're still out there. And um, I give the lights a go that night with no experience and something just clicked in my head straight away. I told them after the show, I'm not doing merch anymore. And they were like, nah, you're going to do the merch and the lights. So I did both for a bit. And then it just kind of snowballed, I guess, just kind of learned on the job as I went. Amazing. Um, so going from, so your first introduction to sewing was through merch and then you got that. How was it doing merch and lighting? Because that is really two different roles. Yeah, it was all right. It was at the time we weren't touring with any production. I was just using house rigs and house desks. Okay. So I'd just, just rock up with my boxes of merch, set all that up then get on the lighting desk, do that, have a bit of tea, get back on the merch. And just get someone to watch the table while I did the band for the hour and a half. They went back to merch and it was all right. You know, I was, I was a lot younger at the time, so I had a lot more energy. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> it was good fun. Not as much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what was that console? Can you remember? What was the first one? The first one I used was, oh, no, it was like a six channel. There was six, 12 par cans or something. And there was a strobe on a light switch on the wall. <laughs> that was it. Uh, and then after, the, after the, the, the tour they did and then it was known as the toilet circuit because it was kind of small venues, you know, 100 to 200 capacity rooms. And most of them had uh, AVOs like, with the roller wheels. Mm. Uh, so that was kind of what I cut my teeth on, the AVO desk. And then a, a, a different one would pop up in a, every now and then, like a hog or something like that. And, you know, I just have to figure out how to do it on that, the same show that I've been doing before. I didn't have a show file or anything. Uh, it was just... 
I had some very helpful in-house lighting techs who would basically help me program the show and even explain to me what lights were because I didn't know what things were called. Like, you know, I didn't even know what a parkan was for the first show. Like, you know, you, do you want to focus the parkans? And I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, so, you know, I, I was basically starting from scratch. <sighs> Still kind of learning. <laughs> Every day is a school day. Yeah. Um, so what happened when you finished that tour? How did you progress? Where did you move on to? I know, did you develop a relationship with GLS? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, uh, there was a woman called Jack Knott who was doing the mon monitors for them on that tour. And her and her husband, Ian, run GLS in Southampton. Uh, and at, towards the end of that tour, Jack, you know, saw something in me and she was like, do you want to come and work in our warehouse? So I said, yeah, cool. So I got a job in their warehouse just basically I guess de-prepping and tidying up and fixing things and breaking things and taking things out to little shows and setting them up and doing this and that. So that gave me the on the ground, some on the ground tech experience, which was really helpful uh, until, you know, that was about six months worth. And then the delays came back out and we actually took some production with us for the first time. Oh, great. Um, so then... Did you kind of go the, the route of doing the festivals, because GLS do festivals and stuff as well. Did you end up doing not just operation, but also taking on a v variety of different events? Yeah, at the time they were doing Big Chill Festival. I don't think it's going anymore. Um, and Beautiful Days and a couple of others. But yeah, I ended up going to Big Chill for a couple of years to help set up and derig. Um, yeah, put lights under trees and around the site and all that kind of stuff put hang mirror balls and you know in trees and do all kinds of weird bits it was great yeah those those days of, of putting uh floods in trees i think are special for everybody in life <laughs> it's yeah fun. especially in the rain <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and de-rigging in the rain um yeah. so after the delays what came next who was your next kind of larger band that you worked with well I was living in Southampton still. I, had, I was lucky. I was living in a house where I was paying about 30 quid a month rent. It was ridiculous. It didn't have a kitchen or central heating. So that was like the, the payoff. Um, so I was kind of, the, what happened was that I think Greg, the singer from the delays, uh, lost his voice. So we had to cancel a tour and had a month of nothing. So I went on the NME.com website and the first thing was a, a band called The Subway. So you had a tour, which kind of fitted exactly in those dates. So I was a brazen little lad then. I just emailed their manager from through their website straight away. I was like, hey, I'm a lighting designer. If you guys need lights, I'm free and I'd love to work with you guys. And left it at that. And two weeks later, I got an email saying, we've got a show tomorrow in Cornwall. Can you come and meet us? So I was like, wow, yeah, okay. So I got on a bus, met them in Welling Garden City where they live, and then got the tour bus down and did, I think it was a student ball or something. And I did their lights on that. And then on the way back, the, the manager was like, do you want to come on tour with us? Well, I guess I passed the audition and uh, I was like, yeah, cool. So I ended up being on tour with them for a month, which then snowballed into a year. Uh, I got to go to Japan and around Europe uh, with them. And and then it just, yeah, just developed and developed, <laughs> just like step by step, band by band, it kept kind of growing out of control. Awesome. Um, do you... Do you think that being in Southampton is why you lean towards a campus console? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. That really helps because they were developing the console in the, the GLS warehouse when I was working there. They had a little, me little tiny little mezzanine up top um, where, where Chris uh, and George were kind of setting it all up. And I think the first tour I did with the Delays, their own headline tour was potentially the first time the campus got taken on tour or something like that. I definitely was beta testing it because all kinds of things were going wrong all the time. And obviously I thought it was my fault because I still didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure there were things that I did wrong. I think the first gig I, I had like six Mac 250s or something and I plugged them all in the wrong way. I did the DMX the wrong way on the stage and ended up, you know, I took it back to front of house and had the wrong end. Uh, and that was just before the show. Uh, I never made that mistake again. Uh, yeah, definitely having those guys there was like the reason I got onto it, yeah, for sure. So and I'm glad, I'm glad it happened because I've used yeah. campuses ever since, on the whole. Yeah, and you have that early connection with the development team, so that's good. I think because our students learn mixed medium, uh, I think nearly everyone's probably got a story where they've run the DMX the wrong way and then got yeah. 
I know, I know I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all part of it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, as you've kind of worked your way up from doing the toilet tours, as we say, into arenas and festivals, what do you think has kind of... Um, were you nervous when you start, first took those progressive steps into the the larger kind of field? Yeah, definitely, yeah. still am. Like, every time I, I get a show that's kind of something I've not done before, there's always the nerves, but um, it's it normally just, you just settle into it because in it, once you start working on something a little bit different, but you realise you know what you're doing, you kind of, I guess, a bit of confidence, a bit of self-assurance, and once you're on the right path, it just flows. But yeah, I remember the first arena gig I did, it was with Mumford and Sons in New Zealand. And uh, yeah, that was a big day. It was, it was fun. Apart from when we were hanging glass festoons and uh, the rigger dropped a whole string of them, they shattered all on the floor. There's no one in the room but me. <laughs> but, other <than laughs> but yeah, other than that, it was, it was all good, yeah. It's obviously a learning experience from that point onwards, you know. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it all. Cool, okay. Um, so just moving on. Um, can we start to talk about maybe like your design process? So I think a lot of people, if they haven't tapped into their creativity, they kind of think, how on earth do you come up with the concepts that you come up with? What's your, if you get approached by an artist to work for them, what's your kind of initial steps that you do to start to produce the show design? Well, every project can be a little bit different, obviously, but in on the whole, um, they, sometimes you get a bit of guidance from from the band, the artist, their management on uh, which direction to go. That could be that could be a whole document of influences, or you know, uh, or it could be one word, or it could be nothing. Sometimes when you start from scratch, I find it a little bit easier, if especially if I'm into the band. Like if I'm into the music, it's kind of quite a fluid process. Um, for example, uh, Michael Kiwanuka, his manager. His only two words with me to, were, were Pink Floyd. They wanted a Pink Floyd vibe. So I was a major fan of his anyway. So straight away, I just thought of the Pink Floyd O and developed a, a show from that. And it, it was easy. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a bit more difficult. Sometimes there's a lot more back and forth to get the right thing going that they're into, that you're into. Um, but it's all about uh, like work. It's all about fit, designing something that fits with the music, basically, because you're just, you're um, accentuating what's happening on stage. So it's all about going with the flow of the music rather than what you think uh, you want to look amazing. It's a, it's a weird one, really. But yeah, it's all about musicality, I think, when you're designing a show. Yeah, definitely. Have there been any artists that you obviously see behind you, a massive music fan, and you've worked <laughs> in a record shop, What's been your kind of uh, career peak of artists to work with? Uh, well, I was I lived in New York for a few years between 2011 and 2015, and I got to working with quite a few New York bands there. And I got an email one day from the manager of The Strokes, who uh, basically they needed a lighting person for the summer for a bunch of festivals, and I just couldn't believe what I was reading. I thought it was a joke. Because I'd been, but when, when the Strokes' first record came out, I was working in the record shop, and you know it was a massive deal. It was such a huge thing that record, and we we had it on all day long. We went to see him in Brighton in a tiny little pub, play for twenty minutes. Uh, just so when I got asked to do the lighting, uh, yeah, it was pretty special. I enjoyed every single minute of every gig of that. Uh, it was yeah. I, I still I look back at that as my enjoyable. I've enjoyed many, many other gigs of bands that I, I work with, but that was kind of a special one because we—it was the first time I'd headlined a lot of big festivals before, so the, the high intensity of all that kind of work and the travel and just everything about it—I loved, yeah, especially the music <laughs> and also the light show for that. I would kind of inherited the design uh, for whatever reason. The, the guy couldn't do it. Um, and so I inherited this design that I'd seen the year before with, with Mumford and Sons when we were in a festival somewhere. And it just blew my mind, that light show, because it was so simple and effective. Uh, and the way it was programmed in, into the music in time 
I, I got to operate that and I got to kind of develop it a little bit. And that in turn affected the way I program every show ever since because it was genius the way it was programmed. So I was really fortunate to have got, uh, got into that one. Great. Um, do you, so recently the word imposter syndrome's come on a lot. As you were mm. developing through the industry, were there kind of moments where you suddenly felt like, oh my gosh, how am I doing here? I was the merch guy. Like, how did you cope with that? Um, well, I guess I've got a certain confidence in myself, which um, I don't know, really. It's kind of, yeah, it's a weird one. I still get it every now and then when I'm like on the, on the way to a big event or something. I'm just thinking, oh Christ, what am I, you know, what if I can't remember what I'm doing or what if there's people there who think I'm an idiot or something. It never turns out that way. It's all in, it's all in your own head, really. At the end of the day, everyone you work on a, a gig with is there to make the best show possible as a team. So as soon as you kind of, like I said earlier, as soon as you kind of get in the flow of the work, that all kind of just disappears and you realise that you actually, you know what you're doing and it's going to be all right. The early days, it was kind of, I guess in the early days, I was just like a young whippersnapper. I was kind of like, I just didn't, didn't really give much of a crap. So I, I just like, was just head on, full on, like just going for it. Um, obviously now, if I went into that, the age I'm at now, I'm a bit more cautious about things, a bit more thoughtful, I guess. But back then it was just kind of like, yeah, fuck it, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so with kind of how lighting, now there are degrees for it, and now it's kind of the, the consoles have got much more complex and it is like um, full on network systems, etc. cetera. Um, do you, how important do you feel love of music is um, to be able to actually produce a show? Because uh, it's 100% about time and it's something that's always said, which is, is true. But what would you give perhaps a student that hasn't, tapped into their musicality how would you kind of give them advice to yeah i mean you can have all the best ideas in the world but if you're pressing the buttons at the wrong time then the show's kind of pointless right so i think a good piece of advice i always like to give is always follow the drummer if you if you're ever in doubt of what to do in a show follow the drummer and try and stay a few beats ahead if you can to see when the song is going to change but in general, when you're designing the show to music, it's good to just immerse yourself in, in the music and listen to it as much as possible, get the feel for it, listen to the lyrics. Sometimes inspiration can come from like the weirdest places in the lyrics or watch previous shows that they've done. Um, yeah, the musicality is the most important aspect of designing a show 100% because it's not about, it's not, the show's not about me. It's not about what I can, it's not about what I can, give to the band it's about what I can complement the band with what I can complement the music with people don't go there to watch a light show I mean there are a few occasions I guess when they do but people go there to watch a band and they want something that complements what the band are doing not takes away from it so always kind of yeah just immerse yourself in the music as much as you can and try and enjoy it I've been really lucky that most of the people I've worked with I've really been into the music the few occasions I haven't enjoyed the music it's it's kind of been a bit more difficult so i can see why uh it can be tough sometimes but definitely just try and yeah just get get in the mood and try and spend a bit of time away from software and go for a walk and listen to music or put it on in the bath or something switch off and let let, let your brain do the work sometimes definitely um with now kind of TikTok, Instagram, and artists really taking control of their personal branding and creative content, do you ever kind of tie that in with, with your design concepts? If they are following kind of a certain aesthetic, do you bring that into part of the show if it's relevant? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It all needs to kind of work as one now, everything up from the merch to the artwork to the way the bands dress on stage to the way the stage looks it all needs to tie in uh on the whole there's some some bands don't really think about that um some bands just want a rock and roll show that's that but 
I haven't, uh, that, what you're talking about is mostly in, in the pop world, I guess. And I haven't worked with too many out and out pop acts per se. I work with a lot of old people really who don't do TikTok and stuff. So, but um, in general, yeah, I think it's, it's important to tie in everything to tie in these days, the video. Um, whereas before it was just more like plonk something on stage and flash it. It's definitely a lot more considered now. And that's why there's a lot more creative designers in, involved in shows now that oversee everything and pull the strings a bit more in that aspect. Could you kind of, have you had much experience where there's been not just you, but also having to work with a creative designer? Could you give any advice um, on how to approach it? Because sometimes it can cause conflict. Um, yeah, this, yeah, the creative designer is a weird one because sometimes they come from backgrounds that aren't tech related, uh, aren't lighting related, they come from other aspects of the industry. So they have their ideas, but you know, they might not translate on the stage. If you're doing a, a certain kind of show, you know, they can come up with some crazy idea and you'd be like, well, it's not gonna fit on the stage or we've only got a day to get this ready. How are we gonna build that? Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of back and forth um, involved in that sometimes, but yeah, it's all about, at the end of the day, they're the people with the overseeing idea and you can't just go to them, we can't do that. You have to give them alternative options uh, or different ideas to steer steer the show in that direction in a way that it'll work. Yeah, sometimes they just let you get on with it. You know, every every project's a little bit different. Do you think that as a designer, um, so I've seen your work and stuff like that. Um, some designers perhaps don't understand the rigging and the tech side as much, and they'll send a design over to the company and expect them to fix it, and then get upset when they're like, "This is." impossible uh because gravity um, <laughs> do you like um how important is it do you think as a as a up and coming designer to make sure you know kind of what actually how things work and how you can build and rig etc yeah 100 um there's no point designing a show that won't fit on the stage or you know it, that that won't fit on because the band need more space it's so important now to get everything prepped in advance uh, on a visualizer, um, like it helps to get the band and their all their gear on stage, and then design the show with every every venue in mind. So you've got to be ready for the obviously the big the big London show or whatever, but then you've also got to make sure that show will fit onto you know, Glasgow Barrowlands, which is a, a smallish kind of stage with a low ceiling. Um, you've got to make you've, I I always try and design a show that will work as with every kind of element that you need in every kind of venue in a certain way. Obviously you've got like your A and B and C rigs, but you've got to keep the kind of general vibe of the show throughout the tour rather than just for one show. It's important to consider that when designing for sure. Yeah, it's scale <coughs> sorry, scalability. Scalability. Yeah. You know that Rosie, we did that with Declan McKenna, didn't we? So Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we ended up using the big the big super wide one until Brixton. Um, yeah. But it was handy to have because some of the venues, it was like um, Manchester Albert Hall. I don't know if anybody's been there. It's uh, up loads of stairs. It's not very wide. But we got in and there was uh, like literally a centimetre either side of the stage. Uh, but it looked great. Yeah, yeah I definitely planned that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked. It was perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, OK, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to load up Ed's website so we can start to kind of look at some of the artists that you've worked with and maybe you just talk about kind of how you came up with the concept. Cool. Yeah, I'm just going to switch now. Um, sorry, everyone. OK, so uh, here we go. Um, so I did rattle off some of... Um, Ed's artist has worked with previously, but if anybody in the audience particularly has kind of a, a question about one or one of the designs, uh, do feel free to pop your hand up. Um, but also, um, let's just go for it. So, um, lovely website, by the way, Ed. Um, Thanks. Really, Thank you, really Squarespace. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, so, um, the website's from most recent to previous ones, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
so shall we delve into, um, I mean, we could talk for, for days about Dr. McKenna because I did it today, <laughs> but I don't, the students probably want me to shut up about it anyway. So <laughs> shall we have a look at some of the idol stuff? I think there's a lot of idols fans um, in here. So, cool. <laughs> When, so when I asked you the question about creative content, we spoke maybe like that's more of a pop side. Obviously, idols are just like pure rock and punk. So how do you go about kind of making it fit for the genre? Stripes. Stripes. <laughs> yeah. Lots yeah. of stripes. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they've, they're a great, great band to work with because uh, Joe, the singer, is very involved uh, in everything. Uh, it took a while to get his trust over a few years, but now he kind of just lets me get on with it. Um, but yeah, there's like, they're, they're unfortunate with them because they started quite raw in their sound on their first album, uh, Brutalism. And then as their albums have developed, they've developed their sound along with it. And their new album is a lot, it's got a lot, a few more electronic twists to it, a bit more to play with. So I was able to develop the show further and add like the like you've got there the led neon with the x4s and the parkans uh well they're not parkans they're led uh little parkans but to keep well just to keep a kind of traditional rock look uh combine the two use lots of colors now um they're a very colorful band despite their kind of straightforward sound mm -hmm. uh and and obviously i was able to sling a mirror ball in there as well which is really handy <laughs> Um, so uh, the park ends here, you said they're LED, are they fitted into bar of six? Um, so some of the students will know what park end is from doing their research, but... I should hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with, uh, I mean, in most of the venues in Nottingham now, they've taken away the park ends. Rock City got rid of theirs finally, it was kind oh. of a, a sad day. Um, but they should all be aware of what park ends are. So, um, were these custom made or are they something GLS stock or was it? Are uh, those uh, Luxabel B blinders they're called. I'd never heard of them before, but I was talking to uh, a good friend of mine, Dan Hadley, who's a LA based lighting designer because he's a big Idols fan. And I was showing him a few ideas I'd had with, the, with actual park hands in. And he was like, hmm, you probably don't want to be using park hands anymore, do you? It's going to get a bit hot. It's going to be a lot of energy drain. I was like, yeah, okay. And he's like, you should try LEDs. And then I approached uh, L LCR, who, who supplied the rig, and asked him if they had any substitutions for Parkhands LED. And they're like, yeah, we've got loads of these Luxe LB blinders. And they're great. They're really bright. They've got strobes on them. And uh, they look just like Parkhands without any of the, less of the you know, heat and hassle. And are they, are they fixed warm white? Yeah, they've got yeah. different uh, color correction on them, yeah. And uh, yeah, we just rigged them in a straight line. I like straight lines. <laughs> I have a question about that actually. Um, maybe it's, I'll put it in here. Um, I love your designs because they're always really bold um, and, and strong cut across and support the act well. But um, with Thank light you. and design being design, it follows fashion and um, Quite a lot of the time you'll see a show and it looks just like another show and everybody's got the same sticks of Skeptron or crossy beams, etc. How do you kind of appreciate the trends but also keep it so unique and different? Good question. Don't know. It's hard really because a lot of shows look the same these days, including some of my own. I've inadvertently ripped myself off quite a few times recently. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird one. It's, it's hard to it's, it's hard to do something a little bit different at the moment that hasn't got masses of video on it, that hasn't got X4s in it. But at the end of the day, it's all about what works for that particular gig. So you shouldn't really worry about what else is going on out there, really. I mean, obviously, you do need to consider it in case you're accidentally ripping someone else off. It's OK to rip yourself off. Um, but yeah, I think it's just more about closing in on what you're working on rather than thinking about everything else, because that can sometimes get in the way. OK, cool. I'm just going to um, click on to, because I know that you were involved with the design of the Halo for your Mumford & Sons songs. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to, can we put Ed on the screen, please? 
I'm going to switch. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring up the the Mumford and Sons one so we can start to look at it. Um, and maybe you could just kind of tell us about the, the process that you went through in developing. Um, yeah, it's actually, if you go on the um, projects section, there's actually a section about the Roby Halo rather than having to... Okay. Yes. There you go, yeah. Um, shall we play the video? <laughs> yeah, go for it, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just like a, yeah, give it a go. Look quite okay. different, I think. Younger. Go in now. They can use Mumford and Sons music, so they had to use some of this. It sounded like it. When I pitched the band, my idea for the new tour involved a lot of park hands and I wanted a way of upgrading them, giving them another extra element, another dimension to the show. And then through the uh, chats with Flight Initiative, we developed it into the Halo. So we have these really interesting collaborative relationships with our designers and then we try and come up with a product, and we believe in the product, we'll invest in that product, so we, you know, and we will give that out as a higher charge. So they get this bespoke creation, but for a, for a higher charge, a higher cost, because we believe in it, because we know this product's going to come out and go again. And also, I mean, these, these, this particular product, we, you know, we're manufacturing, and we want to sell them to other uh, rental companies, you know. This is a, it's a great product, and I think it's, it's got a big scale. There are park hands everywhere, you know. Yeah, each individual uh, ring's got pixelated effects inside, which control the speed and the fade time and everything. And then it, you can change the colour of the effect and the colour of the ring, so you can have two colours at once playing off each other. And I've got the whole back wall of 120 rings pixel mapped on the desk, so I can run uh, animations through that as well as the effects built in. Yeah, it's pretty unlimited what you can do. And rather than using regular strobes, um, we have gone for the uh, pixel strobes. From there, where can we go? We can have a pixelated version, a video version, we can do a strobe version. We've got another two very exciting versions that are um, on the development shelf at the moment, which we're gonna, we're gonna launch very soon, hopefully. I put an article about them online just to show everyone what we were think thinking of doing, and the response was positive all the way. It was amazing. A lot of people got in touch about using them, taking them on tour, using them for TV shows and stuff, almost immediately from the Danish Music Awards. We wanted to use them on their, one of their award ceremonies. We tour with them, they come in flight cases obviously, but we tour with them rigged, actually stay rigged in the park hands. So they travel pre-rigged every day, um, really easy to set up, um, really easy to use. It can be simpler really. We, they did the uh, first part of the tour with the, with the PARS and we were like, right, let's replace all of that with the picks and the strobe and we did that you know, no charge of production. We did it because we were really excited about, you know, getting this new product into an environment and context like this. And that's, yeah. that's brilliant. You know, it's so, it's such a great um, collaborative relationship. Going back to Ed. The ravages of time, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, have children. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Love my kids. <laughs> she spent much more time with them during lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Be nice. Um, so, uh, I mean, it was an awesome product. I remember when they came out, actually. I remember seeing you in the magazines. Um, oh. Yeah, when I was at Ava, I was like, oh, they're cool. Um, <laughs> um, do you ever, do you find sometimes that you are limited by the available technology? Like for that one, you wanted an effect, so you kind of made it happen. Is there some things that you, are there any other kind of projects that you thought that you might include or needed, needed to make something? Um, well, yeah, actually, Declan McKenna tour, we had uh, five, 
quite large mirror balls on that and I wanted individual control of the motors um, but without having to hang them because when you hang them unless you use a metal rod you get the, the swing back when you change the direction or something so I spoke to GLS about that and they come what was the head they took off the motor I can't it remember. It was a, a Roby stage banner it's also funny that I asked that question when I was the one with those <laughs> <laughs> <Nice control. laughs> yeah, so they built great. stage banner, yeah, that was, which has got a 360 rotation. So they put a kind of cradle on the on the bottom on the top of the motor, which turned with it, and then you put the mirror ball on top, clamp it, and then you've got a spinning mirror ball that stops whenever you want. It's great. Yeah, I think um, I think well, most of the HE students have seen some of the videos, but I'll just show some pictures as well um, so they can get an idea. Here well, goes Rosie again, talking about Declan McKenna. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's go uh, on here. Although you won't see them spin in the picture, will you? But just so you can get an idea of where the mirror balls were, guys. So these custom um, units were sat on plimps around the stage, and then it gave just... More creative control to uh, your beloved mirror balls. <laughs> Did look cool though. Gave some really good yeah. effects. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thanks to you, Rosie. Programmed, programmed the <laughs> hell out of that. It was brilliant. It was, yeah. it's a good run. Uh, you were the easiest person to program for, actually, that I've ever had. So it was I'll good. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. That's better than any award. I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, talking about that, um, now that you are so established, you've got so many things going on and so many artists, so you, you're rocking over 10 this summer, right? Um, how do you kind of go about finding people to send out as line directors or program operators? Um, I've got a list of people I've worked with before who haven't screwed me over, and I often get in touch with them, see if they're available. Um, and if not, I reach out to a far a, a wider net. Um, how did I find you, Rosie? It was through um, Brian Janovitz, wasn't it? You'd worked with yeah. him on Flight of the Concords. And I think Frankie McDade. Frankie, yeah. Yeah, Frank, actually, Frankie put me on to you. And then I'd seen what you'd worked on. I'd seen you'd worked on Flight of the Concords. And I spoke to Mark, uh, Mark Janovitz, about, um, about you. And he said you were great. So that was that. <laughs> and sometimes that's how it happens, really. Just recommendations from people. Um, I still work with, actually, I've got Div, who's operating the Idols show. I met him on my first ever tour with the Delays. He was the in-house tech at the Glasgow QMU. And we had such a good day together. He was one of those, you know, lighting, lighting people who was really good to me on my way up. And we've kept in touch ever since. And I've passed a few gigs his way through the years, but this is the first time we've actually worked together on something, like 19 years later. So, um yeah, you know, if, if, if someone's, you can often tell if someone's going to be a good one. And yeah, it's worth holding them close. Okay. Um, and then also, like, some people will only take on people that work on the same console. And obviously, you're open. I, I did Declan McKenna on Avo. Um, do you have any other tours that you send out with other people? I think, is Jazz Hewitt doing metronomy for you? That's her own thing. I'm not working with um, Metronomy. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Unfortunately, I love them. My bad. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> People um, move on. Yeah. But, um, I use um, Michael Kiwanuka's show is all done on MA2 because Tom Shepard, who operates and programs it, that's his desk. And uh, I, you know, like, like with you, I didn't want to limit the person operating the show by telling them they had to use something they didn't really understand. How to use off the bat. I mean, I know you can use a campsis, but you'd f if you felt more confident on tour using an AVO, then why not use an AVO? But it's actually with Idols, what happened was um, we had four days of production rehearsals booked at Brixton Academy prior to the first three shows, which were at Brixton. <coughs> and uh, my plan was to program the show at Brixton on those days with Div. But I got COVID. Uh, two days before oh, no. and so I had to isolate for 10 days so I, I, I had to completely miss the whole programming and first four shows so I actually programmed the entire 32 songs at home in my spare room 
on my desk on capture and sent div the show file he was going to use a ma on that and i was i was like listen div do you want to program the show from scratch we're going off some notes that i give you or do you want a fully programmed show on a desk that you can kind of use so he went for the latter thankfully and we got aziz from camsys to come along to the rehearsals to, to like help him out on the desk for anything he needed help with and i just sent him the show and he touched it up and made it work it was brilliant it worked really well actually yeah, <laughs> that's great. It must be, um, would you prefer to have people that are campus operators so you could do stuff like that and, and kind of have a bit more control, although yeah, you have control anyway because so. everyone wants to please, so. Yeah. It'd be nice, it'd be nice to, to do that, but I'm not, I'm not that fussy really, as long as there's enough time to actually physically get the show together. If I'm sat next to the person programming it, talking to them about things and it, it really, it probably goes a lot faster than me programming it anyway. I'm not that good. I just, you know, I'd rather like, like have someone who's can whiz through programming and make things happen that I don't, wouldn't know how to do uh, than me just stumble through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the things we always try and push on the students is like being able to do kind of master of one, but understand multiple consoles. And um, could you kind of, Obviously, when you go through festivals, there's all different ones there. Like, how important do you think it is for, for that to be a thing that they can work multiple different manufacturers? Yeah, 100 percent. Really, they all do, all the desks do the same thing in general, but they've all got different ways of going about it. But it's it's something you can only gain with real experience. For the for example, with the strokes, that was all done on an MA1. No, it's done on it was the show was originally programmed on an MA1, and then the only desk I could get was an MA2. So it was an MA2 running in MA1 mode and I'd had little to no MA experience. So I went to MA in London and did a couple of days there and then took it out. And I, I learned on the, on the road how to morph and change fixtures and stuff. And now I'm, you know, I'm pretty competent on an MA. Um, same with Avo, like I learned that on the road, Pogs. Um, it's all about just getting your head around the different buttons to press basically. And obviously there are desks that do different things to other desks. And, but in, in the end, it, you, you need to find what you're most comfortable using and go with that. But it helps to have a knowledge of everything else for sure. Cool. Um, so, sorry, <laughs> it's going through. Um, sorry, oh, good question I've got coming up. <laughs> So through your business, you don't just do live music, you've also done kind of, um, I saw you did a thing for Gucci, a fashion thing, you've done TV. How do you kind of um, flip your design so that they work for say music videos or um, TV products? Less, less strobes. Less strobes. <laughs> More often than not, when you do something for TV, commercial, there's someone, a DOP or a gaffer or someone from their kind of lighting world because I'm not very experienced in that kind of thing um I just I treat everything as if it's a gig because that's just how I learned so um yeah you just surround yourself with people who know what they're doing basically and listen to them <laughs> uh, we've got some examples actually of uh your England's women's football could you let me just I'll just do Pictures first. Sorry, Ed, just a second. All right. Um, so you're involved in the England's women's football squad. How did you kind of get the job and then also come up with, I mean, it's pretty cool looking. I have got a video to show of the event as well. And um, I can show that after. Uh, yeah, that was um, a guy called Pete Burton who does all the intros and outros for BT Sport. He does like whenever you watch the football match, there's a montage or there's, there's shots of players doing bits and that. He does, he puts all those together and he, he got us to do this for the BBC and their coverage of the Women's World Cup a few years ago. Is it 2018? Can't remember now. And um, Pete found out about me through a mutual friend who just gave him my details. He's like, yeah, you got to get Ed involved. And it kind of just went from there, really. They see, they'd seen something I'd done previously that was kind of similar and asked for something along that ilk. Um, 
so I got light initiative to build this tunnel of LED strips with mirrors in it. It was really simple, actually. Uh, we turned up on the day. We went to St George's Park, where the England uh, national team is based, which was an experience. I'm a massive football fan, so to just go there and That's spend the day, it was pretty cool. There was up like England. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool there. There's like loads of England players just walking around and Phil Neville and stuff. And and I got to meet all the England women's football team, who were really cool. And yeah, we just shot each of them individually through the tunnel, did a different effect here and there, all kind of England colour related, red and white cross, obviously. And they just shot it. There was actually no other key light in that other than the tunnel, because they wanted that kind of shadowy uh, look, as you'll see in the video. That was a super fun day. Yeah. <laughs> Great, <coughs> really good catering there as well. Really good canteen. Got to have lunch. <laughs> Always helps. It's good to know. <laughs> I'll play the video now so we can have a look at the effect that you achieved. Almost like an infinity mirror. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that for a while. It's cool. Yeah, it looks really cool. Um, I think uh, a good lesson from it as well is uh, quite often nowadays, because um, say younger students coming in, uh, they get very excited to have everything on all the time. Uh, could you give some advice on optimizing negative space? <laughs> <laughs> it's the old classic, isn't it? Less is more. It's sometimes you just need to play around and experiment rather than. Um, yeah, like you said, mess around with everything. Sometimes you can light a person with one single light, one strip. Sometimes you don't even need to light them. Sometimes you can hit them from the back. It looks just as cool. We were lucky there because there was loads of mirrors reflecting the light, obviously. But yeah, the negative space is just as important as uh, the light. Yeah, shadows, darkness, just lighting from above, just lighting from below, just lighting from the side, mess around. and experiment because that's where the fun is really when you when you turn a load of things off and just limit yourself great um with your dalliances in tv um during the pandemic a lot of people kind of moved into the the tv world and it's kind of with the technology that's evolved and all the use of led tape and sketron etc there seems to be more of a need for people of of from the live event music into television do you think that like, you can see it merging more and the technicians would work in both? Because previously it's been very separated, uh, TV and uh, our kind of rock and roll hooligans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure really. I think that, I don't know. That I've got a few friends who did that, who've, but I've got a few who came back because they just found it a little bit monotonous. Um, they obviously get paid, paid a bit better and they get to go home every day if they're working close to home. But um, I'm not sure about emerging because if this, they're both very different. Like you said, we're, we're a bit more of a rabble on tour, a bit, a bit more chaotic. And the travel element of everything with TV, I don't know, it's just, uh, they seem a lot more considered and careful because they have to do the same shot over and over again. Whereas we just get one chance every night to get it right. Um, it's a bit more off the cuff. I prefer it. Like, I'd like to, uh, I, I can redo really TV. It's just, I need the, I need a bit more of the excitement and uh, the, the, the kind of togetherness of everyone on, on working on the tour and the show. I know they've probably got that on TV as well, but yeah. you know, when you're traveling the world with the same group of people, uh, you can't beat that really. It's, it's, it's part of the, it's a big reward when it's right. 
and the just the adrenaline from live i think as well yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great it's, yeah i love it every time i do a show <laughs> what do you Miss think it. now after the pandemic and we're coming back and it's kind of like everybody is on tour has that affected kind of your, obviously you got a lot of artists, has it affected the being able to find staff to send on shows or techs and equipment? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's something that needs to be addressed early in the year rather than at the last minute these days because, yeah, it's really hard to find anyone who's good as available. I was lucky to find a window in your schedule to sling you on something else while you had a bit of free time off. So thank you. Um, but yeah, it's like all the good people are fully booked now, basically. No offense to the people who aren't fully booked, maybe that's for other reasons, I guess. But yeah, it's tough. It's tough. There's a lot of I've got there's a point in May where I've got five different bands out at the same time. Um I think they're all covered. But then you never know what might happen with yeah. people getting ill or whatever, or getting offered more money to do other stuff, or who knows. But yeah, it's it's quite a stressful uh, year coming up for everyone, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's probably a good year to graduate. <laughs> yeah, man. Just get in touch. <laughs> um, so I just want to kind of tie back to um, throughout this. So you still work with GLS for um, equipment. You've also worked with the same bands repeatedly. How do you go about maintaining your industry relationships and just sticking with a band is sometimes hard for people because as the band progresses you get more kind of design houses coming in or creative houses what what advice would you give for a student or somebody working their way up to kind of make sure they're keeping those connections be nice be nice <laughs> yeah. be nice be stay involved like i've i've lost gigs before because i was kind of i didn't give them the attention that they required um, the attention to detail that some gigs need to avoid things going wrong. Um, it's important to kind of, yeah, maintain your attention levels and your work levels, as well as your creativity to, to keep these uh, shows going. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I've, I've worked, there's a few bands I've worked with for 10 years plus now that, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with who trust me, who let me get on with things, but they would still you know, go, go elsewhere if I let the ball slip. Um, so yeah, it's important to just keep your focus. It's difficult when there's a lot going on um, and when there's other things in your life happening and stuff. And sometimes it's important to uh, be honest and say, hey, listen, I can't, I can't do this anymore. You're gonna need to find someone else or, or to pass the gig on to someone else rather than let, let the thing go wrong another way. Yeah, it's important. I've lost gigs because of that before, um, but it's important to learn from making mistakes like that to developing and you know keeping keeping things good with what you've got. How do you manage that disappointment? Because we've all might, like lost a gig once, and then you just feel like, what could I have done more? But how would you kind of give advice to manage those disappointments? Because they are going to happen in anyone's career. Oh yeah. Um, it just happens. You've just got to not make the same mistakes twice again, you know, the same way I haven't laid the DMX cables a long way around since that first gig, you know, just kind of never forget the mistakes, which are just as important as the, the other stuff that you'll learn. Um, yeah, like, well, I went, I went quite a long time without using a visualizer, for example. Uh, I think I learned how to use Capture in 2014, um, which would have been 12 11 or 12 years without using a visualizer i don't know how i survived that long because now it's like i use it every day for everything but since i've started using it i've realized i haven't lost as many gigs basically <laughs> like, uh, when you can present a band with what you want them want want to show them a lot easier it takes half the battle out of the way or when you can design a show that you know will fit on all the stages it it makes things a lot easier foolproof yeah, and, and capture in 2014 to capture now is so, uh, it's like the progression is crazy, isn't it? It was still quite new in 2014, really, wasn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's coming a lot, but the actual renderings look great. Um, the plots, 
you can do rigging, everything. Um, I'm still learning it. They're still adding new stuff. I think they did a new version two days ago, which I don't need to download and get into. Um, but I love it. Like I say this quite often, but doing lighting and the visualization and running the show and programming the show, it's kind of like my version of playing video games now. I grew up playing computer games when I was a kid. Um, don't really have time for that anymore. Um, but now I, 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 I kind of I just enjoy it because it, it's so user friendly and fun. And when you come up with something that's like successful, it's like it's like winning. It's great. What did you do before? Was it pencil sketches? Yeah, just forever. Yeah. I've got I've kept all my notepads. I did sketches. Uh, I just did did stuff without even sketching it out. Just threw stuff on stage. <laughs> it's yeah. a, a mess. I got some. There was I had some friends who drew stuff up for me on Vectorworks and Boise Wig and stuff before. But I'd have to pay them, yeah. uh, and you know that 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 gave out a long protracted process. But now I can, you know, I live in Margate, which is an hour and a half from London, and I can sit on the train for an hour and a half on my computer and design a show or program a show or set up the cue points for a show, or I can do it, you know, anywhere. It's great rather than having to be stuck in one place. I've got my studio at home where I do a lot of my work, but it's, it's a lot easier than it used to be. It's, um, it's being able to use visualizers and understand capture a desirable skill quality when you're looking at people to send out on your behalf on shows. Yes, yeah, it's, it's up there. Yeah, definitely. Like the main the main skill would be the musicality and the rhythm of following a show and knowing when the right time to do the right thing is and when there's time not to be doing something. That's the main thing I'd, I'd look out for. Mm. And then on top of that is the technical knowledge. Um, the programming and yeah, the ability to use visualizers and yeah, all the, all the other bits and bobs that come along with it and, and to be a nice person. That's probably the, the number one thing, I think. <laughs> so be nice, have musicality and then also be good technically. Yeah, I'm sure this stuff that you guys are learning in, at uni is great as well. So um, but yeah, they, you, they can't really teach you to be nice at school, can they? <laughs> no, I try. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Pretty well rounded. Uh, some of my students actually have just done a submission of uh, of capture designs. Uh, oh, maybe I could show you some. Yeah, I'd love to see some. Yeah, <laughs> give some feedback. Yeah, <laughs> one of them's smiling right now. <laughs> I do. I've, I do get people get in touch with me sometimes and um, ask me questions about whatever. And I've had, I've sent my capture file to people who wanted to look at it to see how I've designed it and what I'm happy to do anything like that. I was going to say at the end, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, you can always contact me through my website or get me through Rosie. I'm happy to talk about anything with anyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay. I think now's a good point to open the room up for questions. So uh, thank you so much, Ed. Um, it's been great. Can I see anyone or is it, is it, is it um, one way? Can if you... I reverse, if we put the room light on, can we put a wide shot on, guys, so we can see? Sorry. <laughs> we'll make uh, it work. Rosie. Cool. Yep. Hi, Rosie. Uh, there is an online question we could do while we're sorting that out, actually. Um, yeah. This question comes from someone called Anonymous Attendee, which is, imagine if your parents called you that, and then you're on a <laughs> chat. Uh, I think I've met so, them before, so, actually. This is a stitch. You have met them before. You know them. <laughs> uh, the question is, I do lighting at a local venue for their open mic nights. But all they have are generics. Any advice for keeping it interesting without moving heads? Um, don't blind the person on the mic. Like make them feel like they can see the room in front of them. Because when someone's performing, the worst thing is uh, for them to just be completely struck by, blinded by the light. It's nice for people to be able to see the reaction of the people they're performing to. So I would suggest. Uh, Give them a bit of key light from the sides, uh, light them from behind. So a bit of that light would wash over the audience, uh, but obviously you don't want to blind the audience in turn. And just like I said earlier, keep it, keep it really simple. I, I'm a big fan of side light rather than direct front light. So if there's a way of hitting them from eye level, either side, maybe a little bit from below um, and keep it nice and warm. Great. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions in the room here? 
Ah, there you go, Brandon's got a question. I'm going to hand you the mic, Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Ad. Um, I was wondering, how did it come about you meeting idols and then eventually touring with them on... Oh. Uh, um, <laughs> and touring with them last year and this year? Uh, I Actually, yeah, it's a funny one, that. I worked with Mumford & Sons on a tour and the support band was the Vaccines for, for a good long while. So we got very pally with them and their crew. And one of their, I think it was the drum tech, uh, Marco, he's, he became Idol's manager. I don't know how that happened, but he still is. And when it came to them needing lights uh, four or five years ago, I guess he, I stuck in his brain and he, like, he, he called me and just asked me if I wanted to be involved. Straight away, I was like, yeah, of course. Sometimes things come around like that, you know, like I said earlier, if, you, if, you, if you're a good person and you're good at your job and you're hardworking, uh, people don't forget that when they think they need someone. It's a good way to get gigs, not be a, not be a dick. <laughs> good advice. <laughs> okay. Any other questions in the room? No, everyone's, everyone's gone shy now. There was another, if you want to pause just while you think, well, there was another online question, actually, again, from anonymous attendee. I assume it's the same person. Um, what's the biggest stage uh, slash biggest amount of lights you have worked with? Wow. Um, I think, well, maybe Glastonbury. I don't know. That's not, a bit, not the biggest stage. That was like the biggest deal. The biggest stage and the most lights. I don't know. There's some crazy festivals in America and Europe that have just got everything up there. But again, I didn't tend to use everything when it was up there. Um, Verkta, is it Verkta? There's a festival in Belgium that has the biggest stage available, which is like a mobile stage as well. Um, I don't know. I've got a really bad memory. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the room? There's been, a, there's been a question on Zoom in the chat room, actually. Oh, has it? Do you want to answer that? I, I've not got that open at the moment. It says, what was it like going from, it's from William Elson. It says, what was it like going from a normal paid job at a record shop to learning how to negotiate pay as a freelancer, especially as your skills developed? What's the best way to find out what you are worth financially? Good question. Um, well, when I started with uh, the delays, I was getting 30 quid a day, not including days off. But because I was work, because I was living in that house that was thirty quid a month rent, like one day I'd made my rent, and then I was laughing. So that was quite easy. But finding out what you're worth is always a tough one. Um, I'd say the the best thing to do is not to undercharge yourself, because that kind of devalues the the profession in a way. But then again, you don't want to price yourself out of gigs. So I would say, well, for example, I. I run the uh, lighting venue in London called uh, Lafayette. I designed the rig in there and I kind of organize all the, the staff there and we pay our staff 200 pounds a day rate as going rate, which is kind of like a, a good going rate for a day as a tech. And I don't think anyone should be looking for less these days. I don't know, it's really hard because wages haven't gone up, but the demand has and inflation has. Um, I would say try and find the middle ground between overcharging someone and undercharging. It's really hard, but yeah, especially if you're a freelancer and you're, you're kind of navigating your own financial way through everything. I'd say an important thing is to get a good accountant who can take care of all the, the administration side of everything, because it's a lot to take hold of uh, once you go freelance. You've got to do your, all your taxes and everything like that and keep keep track of everything. And I don't know about you, but my brain doesn't really work that way. I'm a, it's a bit of a mess. So I like to just give everything to someone else and pay them to take care of it. And then they can offer financial advice as well. That's great. Oh, thank you. William uh, says, there is you. a question at the front of the room, but there is also another question, which perhaps from, from anonymous attendee again, which slightly links to that, which is when you don't get a gig, how do you feel about that? Do you try and find out why or do you just move on? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, sometimes you get asked to pitch for gigs where you put a lot of effort in uh, to, to give like a, a 
of mood board or ideas of proposal. And sometimes you don't get the gig when you do that. And that can be a bit deflating. Uh, sometimes you don't even get a reason. So as a rule to myself, I don't really pitch for gigs anymore because they generally don't really work out and sometimes they just nick your ideas. So when I don't get a gig, I kind of just let it go and move on. I'm lucky that I've always kind of, I've never really been out of work since I started. Been really fortunate with that. So there's always been something to move on to. But I'll tell you something, I always have a little look at how the uh, gig looks that I was going to be doing that I'm not anymore. I'm always looking and th thinking, okay, what, what got that person that gig? What have they done that I would have done that I didn't do? Or, you know, having a little spy. I'm sure everyone does it to me as well. It's fine. Great, thanks. We've got a question down the front. You still got your question, yeah? Great, I'll come and hand you the mic. So when you're out touring or anything like that, has that ever been any kind of moment where you start to feel a bit depressed by not being able to see family or friends and how have you got around that sort of situation when you first started touring? Great question. Um, well, I think I mentioned it earlier, but when I first was touring, I was a young, young, young kid like yourselves and just constantly caught up in everything and enjoying the whirlwind and I had no responsibilities really. Uh, so it was kind of all right. I miss my parents, so I'd always make an effort to go and see them. I'd always call my friends when I needed to. Um, but nowadays, I, I always said when I started that as soon as I'd had kids, I would not tour anymore. And that became the case in 2016, actually. I still do the odd show here and there, but I, as a rule, I don't really go away for longer than a week now because I don't want to miss my kids and my wife, um, basically, and the home life. But it's definitely, it definitely affects people a lot harder than it, it affected me when I was on tour. And it's, in, it's definitely, it's important to just talk to people and not say yes to everything, basically. Know when to give yourself time off because I think it was after the first delays tour, I got home and I actually had a panic attack because it had been such a whirlwind of a, of a month with my mates. And, We'd had such a good time and then I got home and I think I was sat in the pub with some friends and I was like, I've got to go home now. And I went home. And that kind of made me think, okay, it's important to have fun on tour, but it's also important to stay grounded and um, talk to people and not let yourself get carried away and give yourself time at home to have a real life. Because that's that is the most important thing. Like it is fun going away and traveling, but well, I'm talking as a 43-year-old now, but I, I find it more fun. You know, and hanging out and working and going away every now and then instead as a, as a treat. But yeah, I guess when you're finding your way, it's not as easy. You just have to crack on. Thanks very much. Any more questions in the room? I think I've seen another one pop up online. If not, yeah. So have a look at the online ones. So. Can I just add to that previous one as well? There, there's now a lot more help for crew and people who are feeling the mental health uh, stress of being away from home now. There's there's a couple of charities that you can talk to and get advice from, which which could have been really helpful for some people I know back back in the day. So there's a lot more help out there. Um, do you think as well? I think in general the conversations on tour have widened up. Do you find like people are more likely to talk about it than before? Yeah, I think it's more, it's not a taboo subject any, anymore, is it mental health, thankfully. So um, touring is now structured to be a functioning machine rather than a gang of people out on the lash, <laughs> a, a never ending stag do. <laughs> now it's more, it's a professional thing, definitely more than it used to be. So it's, if there's a cog in the wheel that doesn't work or if there's a cog that's broken, there's more attention given to that to try and fix it rather than to just carry on whatever. Like everyone talks to each other on tour now, which is really good, on the whole. Okay. So there's another online one then. So how long do you usually have to prep for a show? Um, every show's different. Every project's different. Um, nowadays, with a lot of, like we were saying earlier, a lot of busy summer coming up, everything's getting prepped now. For something that will happen in a few months which is which is great 
because we can get make the time to get the show right technically and uh, design wise um there's some shows that are just like i've got a show tomorrow what can you do you just sling a bunch of stuff out and make it happen um yeah in, every show is different in general with arena tours and full production tours you'd hopefully get a bit of rehearsal time um a, a week or so is really handy a few days without the band is really handy as well before they start coming in and making noise but some tours the Declan tour that we did Rosie you know we had two days in a tiny little room we squeezed every light in uh, the band turn up and just start playing over us while we're trying to program a show uh, but we made it work um you were still finding your feet on the tour programming into the tour a bit more yeah every tour is different you just have to kind of do everything you can in advance to make it easier for you when you hit the ground okay thank you any questions in the room oh yeah we've got one here hang on a second uh, hi ed uh, I know. Oh, that way. <laughs> uh, I know you work with um, Fortet before, and I know there's a lot of creative kind of control that he kind of likes over his shows. Did you have a lot of influence in that as well? Obviously, he'd have to interact with you about it. Yeah, Kieran's one of those guys who um, I've known him since 2007, and we're, we're good mates. So he kind of just we he, we've always had a good chemistry when it comes to putting a show together. Whereas he, he, whereas in like he has an idea or thinks of something he wants to do, and then I add to it, or I just tell him what we should do, and he says, "Yeah, he's great like that." Uh, I just call, we just have a phone call, and he goes, "Like we're, we're doing Glastonbury this year." Um, he's headlining the Park Stage on the Friday, and we had a chat last week. He was like, "What do you want to do then?" I was like, "Lasers and mirrorballs." He's like, "Yeah, cool, let's do it." That was it, really. <laughs> Sometimes it's that simple. But when we did the big show with the, um, did you see the show with the LED balls hanging in amongst the crowd? Yeah, and uh, Ali Pali, yeah. 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 We started that one a few years before Ali Pali with the first show we did with that was at the ICA, obviously a lot smaller room. And it was that was his idea to do something like that. I, I'd been using LED spheres in his shows as a nod to, some of his earlier artwork actually, which had some kind of sphere, spherical dots on the front. Um, and he just wanted, to, he came up with a plan to develop that further and immerse the crowd in it. And that's when we got this company called Squid Soup involved who uh, kind of designed the rig and made it happen alongside uh, myself and Kieran. But yeah, every, every project with him is a little bit different, but on the whole, he kind of just lets me do what I like and likes what I do, which is really handy. I think uh, maybe could you tell him about your Brixton show with him? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so he does uh, over the last, I think it was a kind of a bit of a reaction to the, the giant LED show. He got really into doing shows in the darkness with nothing at Brixton and charging people a five or a ticket uh, to come. And they do all night raves and he loved it. And they went down really well. It's become, got a bit of legendary status because of them. Uh, and then like, September last year, he called me and was like, I'm doing those darkness shows in Brixton in December, but do you want to, do you, do you really want to like mess with people's heads and do like five minutes of lighting here and there? I was like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Uh, so uh, I just thought, right, why don't we sling five mirror balls and five mega points on stage and then everyone will be in the gig expecting it to be dark all night and then like an hour and a half in, I'll just bring up some mirror balls and everyone will go nuts. And it was, it was one of the, like, he, he, he wanted me on stage with him because he had the, the decks at the front and then he wanted me on stage so we could communicate during the show and I could communicate with the other DJs who were playing as well to let me know when a good moment would be. Like they, they'd turn around and go, the next track, there's a big drop coming after the drop. So the first time I did it on the first night, it was, I was there, I was really nervous. I was like, Christ, what if, what if the focus has gone out or anything like that? And, and I just brought it up and everyone in the crowd just went nuts. It was crazy. And, and I left it up for a couple of minutes, doing a few little bits, and then, turned, then it went dark again. And then I went, had something to eat, came back on the stage, waited for a minute. An hour later or so, the next DJ would be like, come on then, let's do it. And then as the, as the night went on, I'd had a, a few little whiskeys 
and uh, we just got a bit carried away and just went for it for the last hour or so, and it was great. It was really fun being on the stage, actually. I've never done that before, uh, getting to see the crowd face on uh, at Brixton. It was, it was a good experience, yeah. He's great fun like that, which is wacky. He's a wacky guy. Love him. Wrong end of the multicore there, hey? <laughs> <laughs> you won't keep me there. I love being behind the scenes. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, one off. Room questions? Any more questions from the room, guys? There was another online one, but I'm tempted to go with someone in the room first. Just got online? No, no questions. Oh, there, yeah, Joe. Got one. Here you go. <laughs> um, you talked about your relationship with Fortet. Is it like that with most artists, or do you find it like changes ma massively from artist to artist? Yeah, it does change artist to artist. Um, most of the people I work with, I've got a you know, I've got, they've got my phone number and they can call me whenever. Um, some of them I've never met, you know, like, well, I worked with The Strokes for those six months and I barely even met the guys. Like, they would turn up at a gig, come on stage, leave, go somewhere else. And actually, there was one show where the, the singer got my name wrong because he thought I was someone else. Uh, during the gig, he like, said, turn up the lights, Jeff. And I think the bass player had to go over and look to him and go, his name's Ed. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't bother me. But yeah, it's all different every gig. Um, it does help to have a good relationship with the people you're working with because you're bringing their show to life and it's quite a personal thing that they're putting out there and you're compliment complimenting something that they've put a lot of their heart and soul into. So when you're all friendly and, you know, everyone trusts each other, um, it's, it's, it's really good, yeah. When you don't know meet someone, it's different. It's a bit more in, in, into in impersonal, but you just have to get the job done and hope the manager likes it because you always hear from the manager, no matter what. <laughs> Jeff. Okay, there's another. Well, there's a couple of online questions actually. One is, um, how do you learn to fix issues with a desk rather than fixtures? I don't understand that question. Was it, oh, maybe is that to identify the issue, maybe? Identify the um, issues. That's a tough one. Sometimes you can learn it the moment it happens. You can see, oh, wow, this has happened. Sometimes it's a software issue that runs a bit deeper. Um, there was a Mumford & Sons show where I'd pixel mapped, I think it was 20, 22,000 LED pixels. We had these Cromlech LED panels, which were... 22 by 22 tiny pixels. And rather than run them through a media server like any normal person would have, I decided to pixel map them through the desk on the CAMSYS and it, it sent some crazy errors that I'd never seen. It was messing with the patch. It was changing fixture numbers and all kinds of stuff was going on. And it, obviously it's quite a big tour, so we couldn't afford for these things to be happening. So Chris from CAMSYS came out to a few shows I'd send them file logs from, from the day and they'd look over it. But it, it actually, those, those errors carried on for quite a few months and it wasn't until we, had, we were headlining Glastonbury. Chris was with me, stood behind me watching me do the show and the desk crashed in the middle of a song. Luckily, the lights, kind of, it was a quiet-ish song and the lights kind of stayed as they were and we, we got the, other, the backup desk going and got through it. But Chris was stood by me and watching me do the show and he was like, I've cracked it. I know why that happened. Um, which was handy, but most of the time when a desk goes wrong, it's kind of like stabbing in the dark because you don't see what's going on underneath with the, with the software. You have to just kind of have a good relationship with the desk's company and send them the logs and hope that they find it and hope that you've found a bug that no one else has to deal with. And sometimes you just have to hope that it wasn't, you know, your mistake because <laughs> there's always a second guessing, like, have I pressed the wrong button or have I, did I, did I change that patch or, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. Things always go wrong. You just have to be ready to tackle them. Great, thank you. Um, another question, what is your favorite fixture? <laughs> Mirable. Sorry, oh, actually, sorry. Let, Easy. They've, they've asked a follow-up one for that. Uh, has, has that instant put you off, Campsis? Just going back to that. Oh, no, not at all, no. It, 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 I mean, that was, that was nine years ago and I st still use them. It made me it made me appreciate them even more because they 
they take the effort to to find out what's wrong and fix it and they're continually doing that there's always updates they always listen they always respond to inquiries there's always someone on the end of the phone or email so no i i, I, I like that you know some other companies you wouldn't get a response after a few weeks and you'd be in the shit so campuses have a good personal interpersonal nature with the people that use them great thank you now you can tell us your favorite fixture <laughs> mirable <laughs> no problem <laughs> mirable with a mega point how about that yeah i think that's two <laughs> it's one um, and an accessory well, okay yeah <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I think I've used a mirror ball on every, almost everything I've done since 2014. Um, so, yeah, you can, there's many different ways to use them as well, not rather than just hanging them in the middle. I, like them. Home. <laughs> I think I did a little exhibition here in Margate in a little room in a pub, and I bought 22 little mirror balls, and I've given a few away as gifts. So I think I've probably got about 10 left, two in the garden, one in the kids' bedroom. And a few in a bag somewhere, waiting, waiting for their moment. They brought out Christmas decorations once this year, and every time I saw them, I thought of you. <laughs> 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 I know, I meant to get you some. Thanks. <laughs> are, there, are there any more online questions, Rob? Uh, I think that may be it for the online questions. Any more in the room? Okay. No? I've got a little rapid fire, although we've had one already. Uh, I'm just going to... Write that question and uh, answer as quick as you can. Uh, Favourite gig you've done? Fuck. What a question. On the spot. Like the one, uh, favourite gig I've operated? Yeah. Glastonbury, headline with Mumford and Sons. Despite the desk crashing, you see? It's not <laughs> the end of the world. Yeah. My, mom was, my, my parents took me to Glastonbury when I was a kid. Uh, so and I've, and I've been there every year since I was 17. So to actually headline the gig with my mum stood next to me, uh, yeah. Did she cry? Of course she did. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, That's brilliant. <laughs> Favourite venue? Lafayette in London. Uh, fantastic lighting design. Uh, beautiful room. Great staff. Excellent self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Favourite festival? Probably Glastonbury. Glastonbury, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rightly enough. so, it's amazing. <laughs> um, well, we've had favourite feature. Favourite console type, not just manufacturer. Console type? Well, Comes this well, MQ70 because I own it at home. It can do unlimited universes. I can take it on a plane as carry-on luggage and it's cheap. Our our left, level three students, that's what they've got here. So they're all smiling really happily. <laughs> I hope someone from Campsis is watching this. How is he? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, my rapid fire questions are not rapid, are they? <laughs> um, what would be your dream gig? Obviously, you've done amazing ones throughout your career, but what would be your absolute peak? I've hit it. I am the go a god kind of show. <laughs> Uh, well, I've always wanted to like Talking Heads. Um, and then when David Byrne did his uh, American Utopia tour, my good friend Rob Sinclair ended up designing it, which which made me happy because I knew he did a good job, and he did. did an amazing job. But that, that was always one that I'd love to have done. But I'm happy that he is and I'm not because he did it way better than I would. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, anybody else got a rapid fire question? <laughs> A slow, rapid fire. <laughs> okay, I think that's. I think we're done. Today. No one's gonna so ask me what my favourite colour is. <laughs> yes, and favourite Lee filter or Rosco. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, favourite colour. <laughs> uh, <it's> blue, <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> uh, I was trying to teach my son. My son's uh, two and a half. He's nearly three. I was trying to teach him to say that his favourite colour was black. And he did for a while, but but now it's, it's orange. He's gone. <laughs> So black would be cool. Well, orange is my favourite colour, so so good work. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been so good to have you. I think oh, everyone's great. Thank you. Yeah, we get a big virtual and there you go. And I just want to reiterate, reiterate what I said earlier. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, you can hit me through my contact form on my website or through Rosie or 
um, anything you want to talk about or ask about, I'm there. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, of course. So we'll put the holding slide on and then I think I just need to ask you a couple of things from the conversation. A couple, uh, yeah, they want to get a couple of sound bites, but yeah. Uh, so I'll be back in two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck.